All right, in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the March 8th Clinical Conference. We have our annual CROI report back, um, and we have three fabulous speakers today that are going to talk to us about the highlights of the um, of CROI, which was actually here in Seattle. Um, some of us have to log off a little bit early, so I'm going to ask you to put questions in the Q&A, and if we don't get to all of them, um, we can um, get back to you after the, the meeting by email or other means of communication. So. To get started, uh, let me introduce our speakers today. We have uh, Dr. Jihan Budhak, who is an assistant professor of medicine here at University of Washington and an associate editor of the National HIV Curriculum. We have Chase Cannon, who is a, an acting assistant professor at University of Washington in the Division of Infectious Diseases. He is also the co-director of the Sexual Health Clinic in Seattle Public a health, um, Seattle King County Public Health, and he's also a provider at Madison and at Max Clinic. And lastly, we have Rachel Bender Ignacio, who is an assistant professor also at the University of Washington and the director of UW Positive Research, which is formerly UW ACTU. So thank you everyone for speaking. All right, I will get started. Thank you, Sharisha. So I will be giving updates about um, treatment, uh, and I have no conflicts or relationships to disclose. And we'll first we'll spend most of the time talking about long-acting injectable cabotegravirulopirvirine and the updates from Croy regarding that. I'll touch briefly on the DEFT trial, which is ART for drug-resistant HIV, and give just a couple uh, updates on weight gain. Uh, so first, regarding long-acting uh, cabotegravir and rolpivirine. So as um, most of us know, the ATLAS FLARE and the ATLAS 2M studies have demonstrated efficacy of long-acting injectable cabotegravir and rolpivirine, and virologic failures in ATLAS 2M have occurred um, with a rate of about 2.3% uh, with every eight-week dosing versus 0.4% with every four-week dosing. Uh, none of these studies included patients with viremia, and in fact, it's currently the medication is FDA approved for people who are virologically suppressed. And I think most of us have wondered what would happen if we gave this medication to those who were viremic. So actually, um, Ward 86 in San Francisco published about their experience doing this between the years uh, between the months June 2021 and April 2022. And during that time frame, they had 51 persons with HIV who started long-acting Cabril, Q4 weeks, 15 of 51 had detectable viremia, and 12 of those 15 achieved virologic suppression. And so at CROI, we got an update through November 2022 of 133 persons with HIV from Ward 86 who started Cabril. Eligibility included willingness to receive Q4 week injections, and exclusion included a history of rolpivirine resistance and greater than one CAB mutation. Patients had drop in access to clinic with rare injections that were given in the community via street medicine, and 76 persons with HIV had viral suppression, and 57 persons with HIV. Um, or with HIV did not have viral suppression. So those, I think really where we're gonna be focusing on is those 57 individuals who started on long-acting CABRIL. Um, here is a table of the demographics of the clinical cohort there, which I will leave for you all to uh, look at. And I wanted to mention that 74% of those individuals of the 133 had on-time injections. Among the 76 with viral suppression, 100% remained suppressed. And then again, this is where I think many of us are curious curious about, 50, among the 57 without viral suppression, 55 of 57 suppressed. There was a virologic failure rate of 1.5%, and two treatment failures occurred, uh, and then that was at less than 24 weeks. And here I have highlighted who those two patients, or not who they are, but rather um, some characteristics of those patients. Um, one was an individual who started with a V179I mutation and had a high baseline viral load, um, and who subsequently developed a Y181C and an L100I mutation. And patient number two started with a T97A mutation, had a baseline viral load also greater than 100,000, and subsequently developed an E138K and an RTI mutation and an R263K um, integrase mutation. So conclusions from that study were that people with HIV with viremia can and did achieve high rates of viral suppression on Q4-week long-acting injectable CABRIL. 
efforts at Ward 86 for those without viral suppression are resource intensive. I already mentioned that there's drop-in access. There is street medicine. So individuals from the clinic have gone to the community and found these um, persons to give them the shots and incentives were used. And although these are resource intensive, I think really it, um, and may not be uh, sort of something that all of us can implement, it will be necessary uh, to reach the last 10% of the population to achieve um, the ending the HIV epidemic goals. Uh, two individuals, as I mentioned, did not suppress and had virologic failure less than 24 weeks into therapy. Both had baseline resistance, prompting an intensification of the Ward 86 protocol to no longer allow any INST or NNRTI resistance, except for a K103N, which was also in, allowed in the studies. And I am eager to see longer term data and also Q8 week dosing data from this cohort. And last, for those individuals who may be um, sort of trying to replicate this, I wanted to mention that their protocol is available on that website. So while that is, again, um, exciting for a patient population for whom um, viral suppression has not occurred, I want to share in kind of rapid fire, these lightning round abstracts also about long-acting cab rill. First, the solar study, and then we'll go from there. So the solar study was a randomized controlled trial of 670 person stable persons with HIV um, on um, Big Tarvi or Big TAF FTC who were switched to long acting cab rill Q8 weeks versus continuing Big TAF FTC. And they found that viral suppression was non-inferior at 12 months, which is not surprising. There were five virologic failures that occurred in the cab rill arm as compared to one in the Big TAF FTC arm. And in the cab rill arm, those three individuals did develop resistance, whereas none in the big TAF FTC arm who um, had virologic failure, none uh, developed resistance. 90% uh, uh, in the long acting arm preferred Cabril after switching from um, big TAF FTC, which is also consistent with what we have heard in the past that people um, prefer getting injections, or at least most individuals do. And as I mentioned, or as I sort of wrote here in the first um, hyphen that uh, these individuals were uh, getting on-time injections and so did fail with on-time injections. The next study that gave me some pause was about these low concentrations in Cabril. In a French prospective cohort of 58 virally suppressed individuals switched to long-acting injectable Cabril, Cab and Rilpivirine um, trough concentrations were low at month one and month three. Only one person had virologic failure. There was no baseline resistance in that individual. And here I have mentioned um, kind of their BMI is 29. They were virally suppressed previously on ABC, 3TC, Dolutegravir, and did not have an oral lead-in. Uh, and at month one had a viral load of 28,000, or sorry, 2,870 without any treatment emergent resistance. And their trough cab concentration was 701 and um, as a sort of as a barometer, less than 1100 is considered low and is associated with virologic failure and um, a trough concentration of uh, 28 for vilipivirine, less than 32 is where we have concern. And they sort of uh, concluded that not having an oral lead-in before the Q8 week dosing and having a high BMI were associated with low concentrations. And I should mention that the median BMI in this study was 24, which is in, um, in sort of American standards not very high, and their um, interquartile range was 22 to 26. So those are those two abstracts. The next abstract that I will just very briefly touch on is um, a retrospective cohort of 144 persons with HIV uh, on long-acting injectable Cabril from UC San Diego. And they found that having at least one detectable viral load in the year prior to switch was a risk factor for detectable viremia post-switch. And last, there was a poster looking at the pharmacokinetics of Cabril pivirine administered in the thigh. Uh, and this is significant because not everyone can um, uh, receive a gluteal injection. So this is a sub-study of 121 persons with HIV in the ATLAS 2M study who had received at least three years of gluteal injections, then switched to 16 weeks of thigh injections before going back to gluteal injections. And they found that the difference in plasma concentrations between the gluteal and thigh injections were not considered clinically relevant in both the Q4 week and Q8 week arms. There were high rates of viral suppression and no confirmed virologic failure. 30% preferred a thigh injection. The median BMI in this cohort was 25. And ultimately, um, while this is good initial data, it is more data is needed on 
early thigh administration, right, as opposed to having been on um, gluteal administration for two, three years, and also what it would be like to have chronic thigh administration beyond just 16 weeks. So that was a very whirlwind uh, tour through Cabril. And now briefly touching on the DEF study. I just wanted for some background to um, sort of remember, remind people about the Donning sub-analysis, which um, showed us, uh, at least in 2019, that dolutegravir plus two NRTIs, regardless of pre-existing resistance to one of the NRTIs, maintained viral suppression, that dolutegravir can fail with in resistance, but boosted PIs generally do not fail with PI resistance. Then um, last year at CROI, the, we heard about the Nadia trial, which affirmed use of dolutegravir with less less than two active NRTIs in the setting of NRTI resistance and showed us some surprising results regarding TDF activity in the setting of a K65R and reaffirmed similarly to Donning that dolutegravir can fail with INC resistance, but PIs generally do not. And then there was another study at Croy last year, the VICEN trial, that affirmed use of dolutegravir or second line PIs as second line therapy. So the DEF study looked at, again, looking at people who are treatment experienced greater than 18 years who had failed first line NNRTI plus two NRTIs and we did not have genotyping on these individuals and they were um, ultimately switched. They excluded individuals who had prior PI or INST exposure, hep B surface antigen positive, who had significant comorbidities or were pregnant or breastfeeding. And they um, randomized people to uh, one arm or to, to three arms rather. One was a standard of care, which was ritonavir boosted darunavir plus two NRTIs. The intervention arm was boosted darunavir plus dolutegravir. And then later in May 2018, they added a third arm, which is dolutegravir XTC plus TDF, which is very similar, which is essentially TLD or tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, uh, lamivudine, and dolutegravir, which is available as a single tablet regimen throughout most of sub-Saharan Africa. And I am glad that they added this arm so that we could sort of, um, because that is really what is clinically used. So this is 831 persons with HIV in over 14 low and middle income countries randomized to one of three arms. Um, pertinent baseline characteristics of the median CD4 was 206. The median viral load uh, or the median HIV-1 RNA log was 4.2, which is approximately about 15,000 copies per milliliter. And as I mentioned, no genotyping was required. The individuals mostly had previously failed a favorins, though a small proportion had failed nivirapine. And the NRTIs used in se the second line um, with the boosted gerunivir was mostly AZT3TC, whereas here we predominantly would use TDF-XTC. And so here is um, uh, an image from their uh, their presentation. I'd like to just highlight here in um, stage two of the arm that the here's the boosted darunavir plus two NRTIs or the standard of care, dolutegravir plus boosted darunavir, and then the TLD version here. And I think the key takeaway points is that uh, if I if I can focus your attention here in the bottom, that the standard of care was sort of was non-inferior to dolutegravir plus TDF XTC, and then here that the standard of care was um, superior to dolutegravir and boosted darunavir. And so the conclusions were that after failure with an NNRTI plus two NRTIs, boosted uh, Darunavir plus dolutegravir was superior to standard of care, uh, and that dolutegravir plus XTC TDF was non-inferior to standard of care. Other outcomes was that mean CD4 gain at 48 weeks was greater in the intervention arms as compared to standard of care, and mean weight gain at 48 weeks was greater in the intervention arms as compared to standard of care. And though the boosted darunavir and dolutegravir arm demonstrated superior, superiority to the standard of care, availability and low cost of TLD fixed dose combination, again, which was found to be non-inferior in most low and middle income countries is a key consideration when choosing ART. And just as again, as a caveat, I already mentioned that the NRTI backbone used with boosted darunavir was seven was mostly AZT3DC. Um, and so there was less representation from TDF containing NRTIs that we more often use in our settings. And last, very briefly, weight gain updates. Um, here is a chronology of the sort of background of weight gain that um, and this sort of uh, narrative since 20. 18, or so rather since 2019, that I will not go through, but I've included here as a resource. And really, it's been since 2019 that we have been potentially implicating the integrase inhibitors and also TAF um, 
in weight gain. So from Croy, we uh, I, I already mentioned the solar study, which was comparing long acting cab real versus big uh, TAF FTC. And in the solar study, they found that of the people on big TAF FTC switched to cabril pivorine, the switch to cabril pivorine did not lead to weight loss. The second update I wanted to give is was from a study in Kenya, um, where they looked at weight changes in switching to dolutegravir. And of 23,000 persons with HIV, the switch from efavirenz to dolutegravir led to weight gain, but the switch from nevirapine to dolutegravir did not. And I actually think that there's an image here that captures that better. In red, switching from nevirapine to dolutegravir did not lead to weight gain, but switching from efavirenz to dolutegravir did. And really we um, have heard that efavirenz and TDF can be weight suppressing. And and there was um, terminology that was used a fair amount during this CROI, um, sort of calling TDF and f Averins anorectic. And so just, um, I thought this was interesting and uh, visually striking. And last, um, the weight changes after switch from TAF FTC dolutegravir. After four years of weight gain on TAF FTC plus dolutegravir, switching to TLD or again, TDF lamivudine dolutegravir for 52 weeks led to weight loss in women with a median weight loss of um, 1.6 kilograms, but change in weight was not statistically significant for men. So I know I went through a lot, but brief conclusions are that long-acting cabril Q4 weeks is effective in a cohort of 57 persons with HIV with thyremia and is resource intensive. Efforts such as this are needed to end the epidemic. Uh, some concerning data emerged regarding long-acting cabril, including the impact of baseline resistance, oral lead-in, slightly increased baseline BMI, viral, virologic failure emerging even in the setting of on-time injections, and viremia in the year prior to switch. So really what Croy did for me was say, okay, in individuals who are not suppressed, I think we need to be more innovative. And in individuals who are suppressed, I'm going to continue to be conservative because there was some, con some concerning data that came out regarding um, potential risks for failure. That long-acting cabril administered in the thigh seems promising, but is not ready for routine use. That after prior virologic failure with NNRTI plus two NRTIs, the DEF trial reaffirmed that dolutegravir plus XTC TDF is non-inferior to darunavir plus two NRTIs and newly demonstrated that uh, dolutegravir plus boosted darunavir may be superior. And last, regarding weight gain and ART, that we should consider whether the changes seen are due to anorectic effects of TDF or efavirenz or due to the obesogenic effects of TAF or dolutegravir. So I will stop sharing if I can and hand it over to our next speaker. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. That was so fantastic, Jihan. Let me see how quickly I can get my slides up. Great. Are you all seeing my presentation mode? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Okay. okay, here we go. These are my disclosures. Okay, so the first study, I, I should say, I'm talking about um, specifically um, HIV remission related studies, as well as some other long acting agents. Um, complementary to what um, to what Jihan um, focused on, and I'll give just a kind of brief rundown of some ACTG presentations. Um, so the first study that I wanted to highlight was really um, the kind of big clinical trial looking at, uh, or small clinical trial, but the, the biggest or most prominent one looking at HIV remission. So this is a complementary study called TITAN, um, which is an, uh, fairly similar to uh, the ECLAIR study, which was presented by the same authors out of Denmark last year. Um, so this is looking at two uh, well-described um, broadly neutralizing antibodies or BNABs plus lefetolamod, which is a TLR9 agonist. The rationale for using a TLR9 agonist in this study is that um, it helps prime the innate immune response and kind of boost um, cytotoxic lymphocyte responses specifically to HIV. And then um, broadly neutralizing antibodies or BNABs um, have been used in uh, several uh, diseases, but specifically in HIV um, to attempt to um, neutralize a, uh, HIV, um, to, to neutralize the virus um, before it enters cells. 
So this is a brief design of the Titan study. I'm going to present these much uh, similarly to, to how uh, Jihan did in a, a kind of a brief snapshot way. So this is a um, uh, two by two factorial study in which uh, group A got placebos for both, group B got um, the TLR9 agonist um, plus placebo, uh, group C got placebo plus the two BNABs and group D got both. Um, this was done in Denmark, in Norway, and Australia. The population, it's notable, um, was mainly um, males who were um, white or multiracial. They're mainly in their 40s and 50s. Um, and of note, um, all of these participants had been on ART for a long time. The median was 11 years. Um, and they had either started antiretroviral therapy um, in their early infection or maybe uh, later on in an infection. So it wasn't specific to early infection in the way that the eclair study was. Um, also notably, everybody was virologically suppressed and had a re relatively robust um, CD4 count at baseline. The other eligibility criteria for the study is that um, they had to have their blood um, screened by phenosense and be sensitive to these, um, to these two BNABs. Pretty small study. Um, there were 11 people in two arms and 12 people in two arms. So I'll just present um, the results quickly. Um, uh, we see in the upper left hand corner in the people who received double placebo that during an ATI, which is an analytic treatment interruption where antiretroviral therapy was stopped, that um, people rebounded their virus fairly quickly. Um, we see in the, in the uh, next group uh, that received only lefetolamod that they also rebounded relatively quickly other than one single participant um, in the groups that received two of the BNAB injections or infusions, I should say, um, uh, that most people had a delayed virologic rebound um, and actually um, several people did not uh, rebound at all. Um, until during the course of the, uh, of the ATI. And then in the people um, who received both, I can get my lights back on, um, the, uh, there was also delayed um, virologic rebound. Um, so it's important to see here that a third of the people who received the BNAB between these two groups um, remained without rebound during the entire 26 um, weeks of the ATI. And um, two people actually remain off um, ART to the date of this presentation. Shown as a survival curve, we can see here that looking at um, combined overall, all uh, participants who received the TLR9 agonist versus placebo, no change. People who received placebo versus BNABs um, were much more likely to, um, uh, to have a delayed rebound in viremia. Um, comparing placebo versus the combination therapy was um, pretty similar. And then when you compared the lefetolamod with or without, um, or sorry, the BNABs with or without the lefetolamod, there was no difference. Um, so uh, I'll just move back for a second. So the, the um, summary of this study would be very small study, um, but showed that um, a combination of these two BNABs is able to delay virologic rebound and that there was no impact of, the, of lefetolamod, the TLR9 agonist. The next study I wanted to present is um, also a study with two um, uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies and um, a lenacaprevir, which is a drug that is now FDA um, approved for people with um, um, antiretroviral resistance or um, significant treatment experience. This is in a different population. Um, the two um, uh, drugs that are studied that these BNABs have uh, very long names, they're abbreviated TAB and ZAB, but essentially they're two um, well-known um, BNABs, but it's a Gilead-specific um, LS formulation, meaning a long-acting um, formulation that is supposed to allow these antibodies to be able to have a six-month half-life. Um, so that also, or sorry, a six-month dosing duration. Um, which matches with lenacaprevir, which is a small molecule, molecule capsid inhibitor, as I mentioned, is FDA approved um, and is also dosed every six monthly and is injected subcutaneously in this formulation. So this is a randomized phase 1b study looking at the safety and efficacy of this long acting combination regimen with len plus tab plus zab. Um, it was blinded, but only the blinding was only um, just between the two doses of the second antibody, the ZAB antibody. So everybody knew that they were uh, was receiving a three-drug combination, LEN, TAB, and ZAB, but people didn't know which um, 
dosage of the second antibody they were receiving. Um, it's important to note this study um, was intended to be a 52 week um, study. Uh, again, people who are mainly suppressed with a robust immune, immune response um, and they had to have um, susceptibility of their virus to both of the antibodies before joining the study. So what happened was during the course of enrolling this study, there was a clinical hold put on lenacapavir, not in any um, uh, uh, way due to the drug itself, but due to a glass vial issue. And so because of that, um, they shortened the study to 26 weeks because they were unable to get the second dose of the lenacapavir on study. And so the treatment outcomes that I am presenting here were the amended protocol in which people received only 26 weeks or one dose of this combination treatment and then went back to their um, routine antiretroviral therapy. So here's the FDA snapshot at 26 weeks, 18 out of 20 participants remained um, virologically suppressed. Uh, one participant withdrew um, when they were virologically suppressed. So we don't have 26 week data and one person had, um, had confirmed virologic rebound and was resuppressed re once they began their standard of care antiretroviral um, therapy. Um, there were no um, serious adverse events. Um, there were two grade three reactions, both of which were um, injection site reactions, and there were some other mild infusion reactions, which are consistent with what has been reported in, um, and we've seen in, in people receiving BNABs, um, and there was no meaningful change in um, basic immunologic function. So this study really sort of um, sets up the possibility of, um, go to this slide, um, this study sets up the possibility of a Q6 month dosing regimen with two BNABs and lenacapravir had no safety issues. And um, uh, there's now a phase two study underway to be looking at this in a larger population and for a longer time period. Um, and just limitations of this study is that the study was performed only in people with clade B virus in the United States. Um, and it's also, I think, very important to note that there were 124 people screened for this study and only 55 of them met the suscept viral susceptibility criteria. So, um, you know, as we know, a limitation of the BNAB approach is that people have to have susceptible virus um, and have to be not at risk of ongoing HIV acquisition in which they might be uh, acquiring a different virus that's, that's different for the one that we know is, is or is not susceptible to, um, to the BNABs. Okay, next study is on um, Islatrovir. Actually, the next several studies are on Islatrovir. So I wanted to take a step back and um, talk about this presentation um, from Kathleen Squires from Merck. Um, so um, many of you may be aware that Islatrovir development was paused by the FDA in December of 2021 due to concern about redu reduction in total lymphocyte counts as well as CD4 T cell counts. And this was inclusive of people with HIV and people who were taking Islatrovir in PrEP studies. Um, so um, uh, the company had to pause and figure out why there was seemed to be lymphocyte toxicity. And so this um, presentation um, this year at CROI um, was an update on the effects of it and what has been done to, to mitigate that risk. And essentially what the, um, the take home with this is that there's no mitochondrial toxicity. So it doesn't seem to be something that is uh, affect other different cell lines. Um, it was or it is known, and, and they did additional testing and found that Islatrovir um, uh, triphosphate, the active form of the drug, preferentially accumulates in lymphocytes, which is part of why it is active um, uh, as a, uh, an antiretroviral um, that doesn't impact, have other systemic toxicity, but it was accumulating in lymphocytes. And these are just some graphs from other previously completed trials that just show the extent of decrease in um, total lymphocytes. Um, and CD4 counts um, in people. Again, these are people receiving Islatrovir monthly injections for PrEP, weekly for HIV treatment, um, and then daily in combination with Duraverine um, and NNRTI um, for treatment. And so we can see that there's been reductions here. Um, these are just some graphs over time that show that um, it, the effect is more severe in people receiving the higher doses and also that in a study, uh, a study for treatment that um, uh, people had quite a big decrease um, uh, by month three of treatment, but that when they switched back to open label 
um, sorry, this is a prep study. So people switch back to open label um, CDF FTC that you can see that the counts normalized and were the same as people who did not receive um, the, the prevention to begin with. Um, and this is just another example of a, um, in an HIV switch study of people receiving the weekly dosing. So um, the take homes from this is that Islatrovir was found to have dose dependent decreases from baseline in both total lymphocyte count and CD4 T cells. And this effect was higher in people who were receiving these higher Q monthly doses and Q weekly doses. The effect was less severe in those receiving daily doses. As of now, um, Islatrovir in the monthly formulation for PrEP has been discontinued indefinitely until this issue can be sorted out. Um, and then the daily and weekly doses are actually ongoing now for HIV treatment, um, but those are at lower doses. Um, they looked across all studies and there's no evidence of association with um, people having an increased risk of infection, um, opportunistic infections, for example, because of these um, reduced lymphocyte counts. And then the dose level that's moved forward in these treatments is now um, much lower. So Islatrovir has been reduced by a third, um, uh, in combination with deraverine for the daily treatment doses, and then um, has been reduced by tenfold when added to lenacaprevir for the weekly dosing. So the last two studies that I'll present, um, I'm going to present in tandem on the same set of slides because they're perfectly parallel studies. Um, so just for the sake of, of time, um, we'll talk about these two studies that were performed before the day with daily oral dosing before the reduction uh, of the dose occurred. So these studies are called Illuminate, Switch A and B, um, presented um, by Molina and Mills in two subsequent oral abstracts. Um, so both in both of these cases, deraverine is the standard FDA approved 100 milligram daily dose and Islatrovir is 0.75 milligrams. So this is prior to reducing the dose. The study on the left is uh, Merck study 017 or Illuminate Switch A. Um, and is presenting the 48-week results from an open-label phase three switch study. Um, on the right is, um, is switch B, which is people who started with BIC um, FTC TAF or um, uh, BF TAF is all abbreviated from here on out um, and um, was Merck study 018. So this is the study design. The population other than their baseline antiretroviral therapy was the same. So both of these studies included people who um, were greater than 18 uh, years of age, living with HIV, virologically suppressed, um, and um, uh, documented virologically suppressed at screening, no history of treatment failure on any regimen, um, no known resistance to deraverine, and no active hepatitis B. And of course, this is because neither of these regimens would treat hepatitis B, so it had to be safe um, for people who had hepatitis B. Um, so the difference between the two studies is that the study on the left um, uh, enrolled people um, as the comparator with baseline ART, meaning any background um, anti triple drug antiretroviral therapy combination that they were on, which is abbreviated here is, as baseline ART. And then the study on the right, people had to be on um, BFTAF for at least three months um, prior to entering the study. So you can see that in the baseline ART study, people are coming in on their baseline ART, which could either be NNRTI, PI, or INSTI-based. And this is who was on the study. Half of the people um, moved to open label um, deraverine Islatrovir, and half the people um, remained on their baseline ART for the first half of the study for the first year. That's where this endpoint is that we're looking at. And then they got um, offered um, open label dera uh, deraverine Islatrovir for the second half of the study. Um, the other study with 641 people is people who are on um, uh, BIC uh, TAF FTC um, to begin with, half moved to deraverine Islatrovir and half stayed on their own regimen. So here's the virologic and CD4 endpoints for both of these studies. Um, we can see that the outcomes for both studies were extremely good for the FDA snapshot. Um, there in the baseline ART studies, nobody in the um, study regimen had um, HIV viremia um, and 95% uh, were suppressed. And then there's missing data, which is always shown in the FDA snapshot. Um, and then for people who were being compared to um, the BF-TAF regimen, uh, one person, uh, or sorry, two people developed viremia in the study arm, 
and um, one and one person developed viremia in the remain on BFTAF regimen. Um, and importantly, they looked at the CD4 changes among each of these groups at week 48. So I'll just include that here. Um, people who went on to derive latrovir overall had a mean difference in CD4 count or mean decrease in CD4 count by 30 points, whereas people um, who stayed on baseline ART went up by 38 points for a difference of 66 points between the arms. Um, and then kind of similarly, negative 20 versus positive 40 equals a difference of about 70 um, uh, 70 points, 70 CD4 count um, uh, between um, the two arms here. So the conclusions from both of these take-home studies together are that Duravarine and Isolatravir were not inferior to either remaining on baseline ART or BFTAF because everybody um, uh, was suppressed in the Duravery and Isolatravir arm in that baseline study. There wasn't a comparison breakdown between the different baseline regimens because overall the suppression rate was so high. Um, and then again, looking at BF-TAF um, in comparison, the outcomes were also similar. Um, they were also similarly tolerated, I would say with the exception of the fact that um, in the group that was um, uh, being compared to the baseline ART, there were 10% more drug-related adverse events. These were mainly mild, um, and there were no difference in serious adverse events. Um, the, diff the, the adverse events that um, presented uh, differentially in people who switched to Duravery and Islatravir were headaches, insomnia, nausea, and weight gain, but all of these occurred in less than 2%, as a less than 2% difference between the two arms. Um, and then interestingly, there were no differences in um, adverse events reported um, in, the, in the group that um, was being compared to the BF-TAF switch. Um, I think it's really interesting that, that this is the case. It is important to note that when we look at switch studies, the switch arm almost always has more adverse events because we're comparing um, somebody taking a new regimen to the regimen that they came into the study on and had been on um, in many cases for quite a long time. Um, and so people are, usually while well tolerating what they came in on and are then being exposed to a new drug. So um, I found that interesting that people that were on the baseline ART study with a variety of ART, uh, that was really the only difference. Um, we also saw in these two studies the previously described impact on CD4 and total lymph lymphocyte count drops, which were modest um, and were not considered to be clinically relevant, although I think given um, you know, the other concerns taken overall were important to address. And then um, based on the information from this study and all of the other information I presented on the, the lymphocyte toxicity of Islatravir, there are new phase three studies that are um, continuing um, with this new dose of Islatravir. So again, that daily dose has been decreased from 0.725 to 0.25, um, and that has been shown in in vitro studies to have less lymphocyte toxicity. So in the last moment that I have left, um, I'm just going to show for reference, and um, please feel free to dig in in your own time on 29 ACTG presentations. I don't actually have them all on the slides because they can't fit, um, but I picked out the ones that I thought were really clinically interesting. Um, so the ACTG presented a lot of data on long-term um, HIV and antiretroviral therapy outcomes. Most of these were from the reprieve study of cardiovascular effects. So really, interest, uh, really interesting data on the association of weight gain, changes in body mass index, um, uh, kind of as alluded to by, um, uh, by Jihan in the prior presentations. This is a different look at that. Coronary plaques, um, CD4 nadir, and, um, and risk of kind of reservoir expansion. So a lot of really interesting um, presentations um, to dig into. And then one of the big, I think, impacts that the ACTG has had in the last several years, um, of which I have um, been part of, um, has been a pivot to focusing on COVID studies. And so um, several COVID studies, these eight COVID studies were presented at CROI, um, some of which have been, I think, um, really influential. Probably the one that I think is the, the biggest take home for me is the symptom and viral rebound um, in untreated um, COVID-19 infection, which was just published in the Annals of Internal Medicine as well, um, concurrent to CROI, and essentially shows that 14% um, of people in the untreated arm had virologic rebound. And so I think this um, uh, gives a lot of context and data to the concern about Paxlovid rebound, um, showing the, the natural history of rebound in both symptoms and vir virus in people who are untreated. Um, and this was my presentation, so I put a cute star on it. 
Um, so um, these are mainly for your reference given, um, given time concerns. And that is it for me. So I will stop sharing. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Bender Ignacio. So next up, we've got Dr. Chase Cannon. Um, Dr. Cannon. Yeah, thank you. If, uh, Rachel, if you wouldn't mind taking yours down. Great. So let's see. Looking okay yeah, there? Yep. Perfect. Great. Okay, so I will uh, sort of finish here talking about HIV prevention updates. Uh, some of the same um, disclosures you've seen about uh, Mountain West ATC hold here, and I don't have any personal ones to disclose. So uh, let's jump right in talking about cabotegravir, so not for treatment, but uh, this time talking about HIV prevention. So HPTN 084, there were several studies uh, presenting updates on that. Uh, for those who don't recall what that was, it was a phase 2B3 randomized double-blind trial that compared long-acting injectable cabotegravir or CAB-LA to daily oral uh, FTDF uh, for HIV prevention in cis women um, at risk for acquiring HIV. So uh, people received cabotegravir as an oral lead-in for five weeks, then followed by two-week uh, sorry, two doses of intramuscular cabotegravir every four weeks, and then they transition to an every eight-week phase of an injectable cabotegravir. So what the presenter here, Mark Marzinki, wanted to, to highlight was um, there were several people who experienced missed or delayed injections due to COVID disruptions, and they wanted to look at the PK and PD data around um, those injections that were missed to see if uh, therapeutic concentrations were maintained. So they put people into two categories. So type one delays for people who received a second injection uh, eight to 14 weeks after the first. And you can see that depicted here in this figure. And then type two delays were any subsequent injection that took place 12 to 18 weeks after the prior dose. So uh, presenting data here from 194 patients uh, or participants, 12% uh, of people had at least one delayed injection. So 19 that were type one delays. That's what's here on this table. Uh, so drawing your eyes to these uh, rows that are in blue, um, most people maintained concentrations above the protein-adjusted uh, inhibitory concentration. So that's what PAIC90 is. Um, and so for the eight to 10 week delay, you can see 100% of people were above that threshold. 10 to 12 weeks, it was around 75%. And then beyond that, so 12 to 14 weeks, 75% of people fell below the threshold. Uh, the medium time from enrollment to injection delay in the study was 49 weeks, and as I said, most people maintained concentrations up to 12 weeks. When we look out uh, further than that, uh, so at 18 weeks or four and a half months after the second injection, um, over 85% of people still maintained therapeutic cab levels. So you can see those numbers depicted here in the table. Um, notably, persons with a BMI less than 26, which was the median for the cohort, were more likely to maintain levels above eight times the inhibitory concentration after a delay. And when they looked at factors associated with favorable uh, PK for CAB uh, LA injections, uh, you can see uh, here on the left side, uh, when we're looking at troughs after the first injections, it seemed that uh, women had a lower trough, so 30% lower than men after just one injection. And people who had a BMI over 30 uh, had about a 30% reduction in a trough compared to people with a lower BMI. And then once people had been on injections every two months, uh, six times, so presumed to be at steady state, you can see that that actually flipped. Uh, so for women, they uh, had what seemed to be sort of an accumulation effect where there was 30% higher uh, concentrations in women compared to men. And then for people who had a BMI above 30, it was lower by about 5%. So um, they did say that they think that is because there's a lower absorption rate constant in women um, and the reason why that accumulates. And then for people who have a higher BMI, um, you know, I think that there's also some differences that you know, we've seen even for treatment uh, with those kinetics. So their conclusions were that despite delayed injections up to six weeks, which is 12 to 14 weeks between injections, the cab LA remained therapeutic at above four times the concentration in almost everyone and above eight times in 87% of participants. 
So, you know, this could mean that in the future that there's a six week sort of forgiveness period that may be feasible for people assigned female at birth who are receiving these injections for PrEP. But of course, this needs to be studied more, um, specifically if we're talking about extending that dosing interval to every three months. Uh, it's plausible, but it needs to be studied. Okay, so moving on to an abstract about oral PrEP in women. So Jeannie Marazzo presented a really interesting uh, pooled efficacy analysis looking at uh, uh, both HIV incidence and adherence among nearly 6,300 cis women included in 11 demonstration product uh, projects across the world. You can see the countries listed there. Um, and all of these studies had to have some sort of adherence data. So either objective adherence uh, based on most often dried blood spots uh, measuring um, tenofovir levels or subjective adherence that could be from a variety of measures, but all of these were self-reported. So I think it's no surprise to all of us and you know, from the voice trial that Jeannie was very familiar with that often there is a, a major discordance in adherence metrics amongst cis women. So here on the left side, you can see what was objectively uh, described from the dried blood spot uh, measurements that they were taking compared to subjective. So the more blue means higher adherence. So at 16 weeks, for instance, you can see that about, you know, 60% of women said that they were taking seven or more tablets a day, but compared to objective adherence data, that was more like 10%. So quite a big difference. And both of these do decline over time for both subjective and objective measures. The reason that's important uh, is because they wanted to look at HIV incidence by these categories. So they grouped the participants uh, from all of these studies into four categories of adherence. So consistent daily, meaning they took at least seven tablets a week, consistently high, which is four to six a week, high but declining two to three tablets per week, and then consistently low, less than two tablets per week. For the sake of time, I did not show a slide where they uh, looked at the tra trajectory of these people um, using group-based methods over time. There wasn't a major switch, um, but I wanted to focus mostly on the HIV incidence. So I think the key takeaway here is that between the consistently daily and the consistently high groups, the HIV incidence was almost the same. So very close to zero. There was only one new infection in the people who took four to six tablets a week. Compared to, as we might expect, people who had lower adherence, the HIV incidence per 100 person years was quite a bit higher. So what they concluded was that FTDF is similarly effective for cis women taking at least four tablets a week versus seven. And even with low HIV incidence, there's better adherence associated with lower risk. Um, and given inconsistent adherence to oral PrEP, long acting agents may be preferred for this population. So she went even further to say, perhaps this may shift the paradigm for counseling regarding time to protection for cis women. And you know, we've typically said that uh, for cis MSM, maybe four tablets a week is enough to provide protection. And that may be the case now for women. So I think that was uh, a shock to a lot of people in the audience and was maybe a bit controversial. And I'll leave that to you to sort of think about for your own practice. Uh, but there are data at least to support that from this study. Okay, so I wanted to end talking about the future of prevention. So a lot of really interesting and novel uh, new modalities for HIV prevention. And so I'll go through a handful of those abstracts that I found to be the most fascinating. So the first was an ultra long acting uh, in situ forming implant with cavotegravir. So this is a subcutaneous injection that it contains a biodegradable polymer that can be mixed with a solvent and then any drug of choice. So in this case, cavotegravir. And once it's injected, it actually uh, go, undergoes a phase inversion and turns into a solid that is essentially an in situ implant in the body. So they expect that this has a duration of action for at least a year at four times above the PAIC90, which we talked about earlier. And you can see here on this graph on the left side that concentration levels were very high in these mice uh, and female macaques up until about a week, sorry, 180 days at which point they removed the implant. Um, and you can see uh, they put some radio opaque material in, the, uh, in the, the implant so you can actually see where it is and whether it moved over time. So up to 210 days, it seemed to be in the same place. And then once they removed the implant at 180 days, the cab levels did drop, but they persisted. So they're looking at the PK tail um, data still that's pending, but it seemed to be about 25% of drug and 15% of the polymer that was left even after they explanted the, um, 
the injection. So really interesting for people who might want something longer and you know it could be reversible, uh, some more data to come on this in the future. Another interesting uh, modality was on-demand inserts for HIV PEP and PrEP. So this is a fast dissolving TAF and L-Vitegravir product that would be inserted into either the vagina or the rectum and has shown in non-human primates, uh, non-human primates to, to provide protection against SHIV. And so this was uh, a study that was presented um, open label assessing PK and PD data uh, using one or two rectal inserts in humans. So um, this is what the insert looks like. It's pretty small, about one and a half millimeters in length. Um, there was only one drug-related adverse event, so mild anal erythema, and then l vitegravir levels were high uh, up until 24 hours, and tenofovir levels up to three days. And then those levels of the tenofovir exceeded those that were compared to steady state concentrations in other studies when people were taking four or seven tabs of oral TDF. And then another presenter uh, showed data on PEP uh, for these inserts. So you can see here on the top and this sort of blue green line, whenever the insert was placed four hours after an exposure in the vagina, uh, that 100% of the animals maintained protection against shiv. At eight hours, that protection fell a little bit, but was still very high at 94%. And then at 24 hours, uh, if inserting the product after the um, exposure, we see that that PEP level of protection drops to 77%, um, all very high compared to placebo, where nine of nine animals uh, acquired SHIV after exposure. So, you know, I think this is uh, great evidence to maybe provide different options for people to be used as PrEP versus PEP. So we will stay tuned to see more about that. Just a brief uh, moment on lenacapavir. So this was already discussed by Dr. Bender Ignacio, but this uh, agent showed that it fully protected macaques after shift challenge seven weeks after subcutaneous dosing. So you can see the infection rate there, 63% in those who were untreated versus 27% in the treated, um, if the target levels were reached. And I think mainly I wanted to highlight here that there are um, two clinical trials already happening, purpose one and two, looking at lenacapavir, uh, long acting for PrEP. And the, the authors mentioned that there is soon to start a purpose three and four that will specifically look at this agent um, in different populations, which will be good for Black women specifically, and then also people who inject drugs. So um, I think it was great that they are already starting to get these data rather than waiting for um, you know, us to be 10 years out before we actually look at efficacy in these populations. Um, second to last here. So um, there was a lot about his Latrovir implants. So I'm just showing you two different abstracts here. One on the left was an implant that can be put into the arm. You can see that here on this animal that showed that there was uh, high protection levels uh, when there was a repeated shiv exposures. Um, there was one animal who had a breakthrough um, and that was due to having low is Latrovir levels um, at week 26. Um, but the majority five of six uh, were protected when they had therapeutic as latrovir levels in the plasma. And then on the right side, a really cool uh, new sort of device that is a, a port that can be, has ports that are refillable, but it's an implant that's about the size of a penny that can be put into the body. And then once the drug is low, you can kind of take syringes and you know, pull out the media and then refill it with medication. So when this was used in uh, animals, 100% of infections were prevented uh, when they had rectal and vaginal shiv exposures and therapeutic levels were maintained out to 20 months, so almost uh, two years. And finally, I'll end on uh, what I thought was maybe fascinating, a role of microbiome in HIV uh, prevention. So this author here uh, talked about the uh, lactobacillus gasseri and lactinosporaceae bacteria that uh, were found to, through a tryptophan metabolism pathway, uh, inhibit HIV in cell culture. So you can see here, C. immunis is one of the organisms from these, um, these groups. And uh, it really inhibited HIV at both entry and uh, reverse transcription and also integration. So uh, really interesting. Um, and this is sort of the mechanism that they proposed here uh, through this tryptophan metabolite. So. Uh, We'll see how this uh, is sort of put into practice and whether uh, translational researchers will take this uh, to the next step for HIV prevention. And that is all I have. I know we are short on time for questions, but 
Hopefully we uh, have a few was moments. One, there was one question on the chat, uh, Dr. Cannon. Is anyone studying weight-based long-acting CAP or LP dosing? Uh, that is a great question. So that is more for treatment. Um, I focused a lot on prevention since that okay. was the topic I was giving. Um, but yep. there, there were several discussions about weight um, with CAB, LA, and ropivirine. Um, but I guess is, is the question about whether the dosing should be different by weight or whether it caused weight gain? Um, well, wait a couple of seconds to see if we can get that clarification. If not, we can relay those questions to Dr. Brewer. Okay, whether it should be different by weight. Ah, okay. Uh, it likely was. I don't recall that off the top of my head, but um, if we maybe save that question, Jihan might know the answer. Yeah. Well. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Kennan, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, I know we're a bit rushed this morning, but again, thank you very much. Please take the time to, uh, to um, uh, respond to the evaluation, and we hope to see everybody here uh, in our next ACC. That's going to be April, uh, what's it, April 18th with Dr. Manoj Menon and Matthew Triplett, who are going to be talking about cancer and HIV. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today, and we hope to see everybody here with us uh, next month.